I want to go to magnitude, Jordan. And John mentioned your 118 weak pound sterling call, but is Q3 a quarter of magnitude for the major foreign exchange pairs? I think so, Tom. I mean, risk appetite is on the proverbial barbecue, the yakiniku, as we say in Japan. Well, look, when it comes to what's going to happen in the next few months, next month is a key one for Europe. We've got the potential for Nord Stream 1 to have its all of its gas supplies cut off. 60% of those gas flows are already cut off. So we're actually just talking about the last 40%. So it's not even that big of a deal now. We've already had the big move lower in the gas flows. That means Germany could consider <coughs> rationing its uh, gas supplies to industry. So that's going to affect Europe in a big way. That's why re recession fears are really picking up, not just in the US, but in right. Europe as well, Tom. And for the UK, it stands out as the main country in, in Europe that hasn't done enough to subsidize the consumer, but also it raised taxes. And then third of all, it has a central bank that is unlike the ECB and unlike the Fed, it's not really being accused of being behind the curve because it's been raising rates for longer since December of last year. So that's why we're already seeing the Bank of England toying with the idea of, well, maybe we don't need to be too hawkish because there is a growth impact as a consumer confidence crisis building up. And that's right. why we think cable will go towards 118. And I think early August, when the Bank of England disappoints us, Mr. Uh, I think was, they'll do a 25 basis point rate hike instead of 50. Mr. Kuroda was not on Francine Lacroix's uh, market moving panel this week uh, in Centra. Extrapolate sterling weakness over to the magnitude of the move we're going to see in Japanese yen. Tom, the Japanese yen has been really difficult for everyone. Uh, there's two or three things going on. First of all, when U.S. yields go higher, the Japanese yen tends to weaken. Second of all, when oil prices go up, the Japanese yen tends to weaken. Well, now we're having U.S. yields go lower. Now we're having uh, risk off at the same time. That usually leads to uh, Japanese yen strength. And we're having oil prices soften too. So I'm surprised dollar yen is being so calm on a day like this with the rally we're seeing in fixed income. But at the same time, there is a global story about energy prices in the winter coming up where LNG is going to be in big demand. And that's going to really weigh on Japan's trade balance. So short term energy prices might be weak. Uh, it depends where you're looking, because in Europe, gas prices are not weak. They're really accelerating. So I think that's pushing up LNG prices and that's making it quite difficult for the yen to rally in the environment that we're in, even though we're having this huge fixed income rally today. Jordan, what a tough spot for this ECB, for President Lagarde, for euro dollar. It just feels lose lose at the moment, Jordan, if they hike. It's a euro weakness story for many people. They anticipate a recession. If they don't hike, it's for all the wrong reasons. It's south of euro. Jordan, is it a lose-lose situation? Can you envision a situation where this euro does get a bid, this euro does rally? There is a way. There is a way. I mean, we're, we're looking for parity, so I don't think that is going to rally. The, the, the view from us is euro is a sell. But I, I, there is a way, which is we find some reason collectively as a market to say global growth expectations are going to turn around. They're going to improve. When that happens, euro goes higher, always, pretty much. Euro is a pro-cyclical currency. So what could lead to that risk on? Well, it could be a ceasefire in Ukraine and Russia. We could see energy prices soften as supply hopes would improve. The other one is China. We have either a large fiscal announcement in China as they are coming out of COVID lockdowns. They might want to do that. Or they might relax their zero COVID policy, allowing more free trade of people, of commodities and so forth in the supply chain. So that could be another way of doing it. Or we see the Fed turn dovish uh, and say, actually, we're not going to raise rates as much as we think. Uh, what we're seeing today, uh, a massive repricing of the US curve. But again, euro dollar is not heading higher. So I think we're in a different framework where we shouldn't be using yields to say where euro dollar is going to go. We should just be using growth expectations once again. So. FX has many different frameworks. The key part is knowing which is the right one to use today. And I think it's that growth framework that is, is the dominant factor for the time being. So, Jordan, with that in mind, how relevant is ECB policy to what happens with the euro? It's definitely relevant. Um, so, for example, we've had some hawks. For, uh, the Lithuanian um, uh, council <laughs> member was saying we could do more than 25 basis points in July. I think that's very unlikely. But if they were to do that, you would get a short term boost to euro. But we've had buns go from 0% in March to, I know where they've moved today, but we went up to uh, 180 at one stage. Close to, yeah. The euro fell during that period in those three months. So <clears throat> we went from 112 right. to 104. So higher euro yields 
It's not leading to a stronger currency. So it is a bit of a lose-lose for the ECB. They're trying to stop the currency right. weakening. But at the same time, fundamentally, their terms of trade is collapsing. So there's a huge macro driver pushing the euro lower, and the ECB would have to do a lot right. more to improve things, but that would just equal recession. Uh, Jordan, the Little Red Book is not Mao's book of China. It is Stanley Fisher's book from 1998 through the crisis, IMF lessons from a time of crisis. Everybody in the middle of the first decade of this century had to read this uh, in the game. Fisher would say, watch EM. Now that's away from your remit at Namur I get, but I'm sorry, Thai bot unraveling, Indonesia ready to go through 15,000, Filipino with Marcos looking at 60. What is the symbolism to the developed institutions that EM is unraveling before our eyes? Agreed. We've got basically short EM positions. We're pushing long dollar Philippines, for example, as a team. It's going to be really difficult for EM to rally in this environment with higher U.S. yields, pushing up the cost of funding for everybody out everywhere. The hope was that tourism flows could support some countries such as Thailand, and that might still be the case. But we could have COVID waves offset that. But in general, if you have peripheral yields in Europe, if you have U.S. credit widening like we are, essentially systemical stress in the credit market is building up. That is just not an environment where emerging markets, especially those with uh, trade deficits, current account deficits, do well. That's just not going to happen. So for the time being, it's quite from a structural perspective, given our long dollar view that we have in this quarter, I expect um, emerging markets to underperform. You at 75 for the Fed this July. Is that what you're looking for? That's it. That's right. So our team, our US economics team has really hit the nail on the head. They have with, I know. Their, with their Fed calls. I think they're going to be right for next year as well. So we have 75 coming up for the next meeting. But let's talk about what we published over the past two weeks. They're calling for a recession next year. They're calling for a recession this year in Q4. That's a lot earlier than other sell side banks. Um, that's Robert Dent and Aichi San to pushing those views. When it comes to next year, we are pushing also Fed hikes to finish in the, in the first or second quarter. Let's say we get to May. We get to a terminal rate of around 3.5%. And then the Fed starts to cut rates from September onwards, 25 basis points a meeting. And I think that's what the market's doing. It's moving towards the view from our US team today. Jordan, who leads that team? We'll just give them a shout out because they've been great. I did. Robert Dent, Aichi. Those guys have really yeah. pushed the view really well. 